Just tell me, are you ready? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, all right, hold on one second here. I will let's just pray for the best. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight and um, to listen to Dr. Shailene Woods and talk about how to treat low back pain. Um, we know it's a beautiful day out, so thank you for taking the time and joining us. So there, I just there's some housekeeping notes that I want to go over. Please um, make sure that if you have any questions during this whole webinar, that you are able to um, put it in the Q&A at the bottom of the box. And we will get back to the questions at the end of our presentation. We should be about 45 minutes to an hour for tonight's presentation. So right now, I would like to introduce Dr. Shailen Woods, and she is going to go over how to treat low back pain. Dr. Woods? Hi, good, af uh, good afternoon, and thanks again, Melanie, for introduction. And also, I'd like to thank all of you guys for tuning in. It's a wonderful day outside. So the fact that you are sharing a few minutes with me um, is um, uh, commendable. Um, all right, so I'm going to be talking about how to treat low back pain. Uh, but before I get into that, just a little bit about myself. Um, I do need uh, control, Melanie. I so did. I, I did. Oh, yep. here we go. Okay. okay. So as far as my educational training, um, let's see here. Uh, so I did my undergraduate training at New York University uh, through the College of Arts and Sciences. And then I went on to do uh, medical school at Rush University Medical Center, which is a um, uh, health arts uh, school in um, Chicago, Illinois. And then I went on to do both residency and fellowship training at UPMC in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. I did a residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation. And then I went on to do my fellowship in sports and spine uh, medicine. And I served as uh, chief resident uh, in residency, but then I also went on to serve as fellowship director once I graduated the fellowship program for about three years. And then all of that led me to uh, Rothman Orthopedics, which I'm happy to uh, serve the community uh, with my husband, who's also a spine surgeon. And um, so moving along, let's see here. And my apologies for a little bit of the technical difficulties here. So um, just a little bit about where I practice. Um, I'm at the Egg Harbor Township uh, location. Uh, the address is there for you. So if you feel like I can be of any help to you, uh, please uh, check me out. So objectives, I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time uh, discussing statistics about back pain, uh, basic anatomy, uh, imaging, and then uh, transition into structural causes of back pain, uh, treatment, and then some common myths and questions uh, that I often um, hear patients uh, either ask me or discuss. And so I wanted to provide some clarification there. So uh, statistics, 80% uh, of people experience low back pain in their lifetime. And I'm sure if you're not experiencing back pain uh, yourself, you probably know someone uh, near and dear to you that, it is also, that is experiencing back pain. It is a leading cause of missed work and disability. Uh, genetics uh, plays a role. Um, I know some of you probably have a, you know, a close relative who's dealing with back issues. So oftentimes if you have a mother, father, or sibling that is experiencing uh, back issues, uh, more than likely um, uh, that may be um, your uh, destiny as well, unfortunately. Uh, with regards to gender, uh, women uh, appear to be more affected than men. And there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is um, the postmenopausal uh, changes and the hormonal changes that we experience that affects our uh, women's ability uh, to build muscle. And also it makes um, the bones weak and susceptible to fractures. And then uh, finally, um, during childbearing years when we're pregnant, um, that can also cause weakness of the core musculature and also further contribute to some back pain. And then finally, increased BMI, oftentimes uh, 
um, elevated um, uh, BMI or increased weight, particularly around the abdominal section, uh, can be a cause uh, for back pain. Um, but I always like to mention that skinny people have back pain too. So I know many of us are uh, trying to lose weight here and there, and certainly that can be a benefit. But know that there are many factors that contribute into back pain, not just uh, weight gain. So with basic anatomy, uh, focusing on the lumbar spine, uh, it's kind of five, five, and five. So there's five lumbar vertebrae, there's five discs, and there's five spinal nerves. Um, since the sacrum is um, in close proximity uh, to the lumbar spine, um, just also important to mention that there are five uh, fused vertebrae there, and there are a couple of nerves that exit out of there can, that can sometimes um, uh, become an issue and cause um, nerve compression or leg pain. So basic spine anatomy, uh, so the vertebral bodies, so these are the um, kind of square bones that you see um, on x-ray or um, uh, MRI, and um, the purpose of them is to bear load or to bear weight. Um, uh, so they uh, uh, support about 50, about half of our, our weight, and so that's why it's important, or you can notice that as you get um, lower down to the base of the spine, the bones um, increase in size and mass, and that is because there is more load bearing uh, that is um, uh, that is transmitted to those areas. So then uh, the uh, discs. Um, are um, very uh, closely uh, related to the spine or in proximity to the spinal nerves. I'm not gonna spend too much time speaking about spinal nerves because those are usually um, issues that are contribute to leg pain. So focusing on uh, the intervertebral disc, again, there are five discs and they are in between each of the vertebrae or our bones and they act as a cushion or shock absorbing um, uh, a structure. And um, what happens is the majority of this disc is comprised of uh, water. And that will become important uh, in the future when I talk about um, abnormalities or pathology of the disc. But uh, it's majority content of water. And then there is a uh, outer fibrous layer called the annulus. And that is where um, there is nerve endings or nerve supply. And so that becomes important when we start talking about disc herniations and why they become painful. And then the facet joints, these are small little joints that kind of interlock the spine, almost like building blocks. Um, they allow the spine to twist, bend, and, um, and rotate. Uh, so bend, extend, and twist. And just like joints um, like your knee or your hip, uh, you can develop abnormalities like arthritis and, and things of, those nat of that nature, which can be a source of pain. And then finally, a larger joint uh, called the sacroiliac joint. That's a larger um, a joint that's formed by the tailbone and part of your pelvic bone there. Um, that can certainly be a source of pain as, as well. Um, on the picture to the right, uh, you can see that the joint um, is well stabilized with multiple ligaments. And so um, you're not supposed to get too much motion or movement from that joint, unlike the facet joints where there's more motion to allow for bending and twisting. Uh, that is not the case with the SI joint. And so um, oftentimes um, when there's increased motion through this joint, which I will discuss later, that can uh, potentially be a source of pain. Looks like Melanie, I'm having, here we go. I apologize for some of the technical difficulties here. Uh, so I wanted to spend some time talking about imaging because I know we um, oftentimes will start off with x-rays in the office and we'll go over them. Uh, so x-rays are really important if you want to look at alignment, um, uh, the joints and uh, the vertebral bodies or the bones. Uh, so when I get x-rays looking at this AP view, the first thing I'm looking at is, is what I mentioned is alignment. So I'm making sure that the, the spine isn't curving to the right or to the left. Sometimes that can occur with scoliosis or postural if someone's leaning to the right or the left that can um, make the appearance of the spine to be curved. Uh, in the side view or the lateral view, I'm also looking at alignment, uh, looking to see if um, there is a normal uh, curvature uh, in the spine here that's called lordosis. And then also I'm looking at each of these squares, which as I mentioned before, are the vertebral bodies or the bones. 
in between each of the bones are the disc spaces. And so when looking at x-rays, uh, you can't see the actual disc themselves, but you can see the spaces. And based on the way that the space looks, you can make some determination if there's something going on with that disc, possibly some aging or disc degeneration, but you cannot tell if a disc is herniated. That's a very, very important uh, to mention. Here are these oblique views or side views. And the reason why we obtain these views is to get better um, assessment of the joints, those facet joints that I mentioned. And so they're kind of here, maybe hard for you to see, but we'll look at these joints. We look at, at the joint space uh, to see if there's any arthritis or degenerative changes. Uh, so that's why we get the oblique views. And so here's an MRI, and as you can see, it looks quite different. You see varying uh, degrees of color, uh, grays, blacks, white. And then here, what I want to point out is you can actually see uh, the discs themselves. So um, this is a sagittal view, and it's a T2 view, which uh, means that fluid is going to show up bright in appearance. And so when I mentioned before that uh, discs um, constitute primarily of water, that is um, illustrated here where you can see it's almost like a jelly donut, where you see a nice kind of light grayish area in the disc. And so that's what you wanna see in a healthy disc, because um, that um, indicates fluid, uh, water, hydration, and uh, the overall health of the disc. In this area here, which is white, again, that represents fluid. So that's the spinal canal where the cerebral spinal fluid is. And that's where the nerves kind of sit, the spinal nerves. So what we look in this case is, again, look to see if the healthiness of the disc. We also look to see if there is any herniation or bulging of the disc into the spinal canal, which could potentially uh, compress the nerves in that area. Uh, this is an axial view, and this gives us more information about what's going on with the nerves as well as the joint. So when I'm explaining uh, MRIs to patients, I'm always sort of mentioning the disc as almost like a kidney bean shaped structure. Uh, and then the joint is actually kind of looks like a Y or a fishbone. So in between the disc and the joint are the, where the nerve roots lie. They lie here and they lie here on the sides. Um, and so this is where we're looking to see if there's any nerve compression. Uh, you cannot really determine in a sagittal view or the side view if there's any nerve compression. You have to look at this view. So some structural causes of low back pain, which I will get into in more detail, we're going to talk about muscle or ligamentous uh, uh, back pain, uh, disc pain caused by disc, uh, joint, and then a uh, few causes uh, related to the bone itself. So a lumbar sprain or strain, I'm sure many of you probably heard this terminology before. Um, it, it refers to injury to the ligaments, muscle, or, or tendons in the low back. So if you're referring to uh, the muscle, then that you're saying that you strained the muscle. If you are um, referring to the um, uh, ligament or tendon, that's more of a sprain. So typically when someone experiences lumbar sprain or strain, there's usually some sort of an inciting event or trauma. So you can sort of pinpoint what happened. You lifted something heavy, you know, you, um, you fortunately you fell down um, or a motor vehicle accident. There's always usually some sort of um, an inciting event where you can, that triggered or precipitated the symptoms. Um, in this case, uh, the muscle or that area in your back is often tender to touch. Um, often uh, spasms will occur in that area. Uh, typically last days to weeks. There are some cases where it can last longer, but usually within that time frame um, is when um, uh, the duration of the symptoms. So uh, pain related to a disc, there's uh, two uh, different categories. One is degenerative disc disease. And it's important to uh, uh, point out that when we say degenerative disc disease, we're, it's not really a disease, it's a condition. Um, it uh, is associated with wear and tear of the disc. So as I mentioned before, a healthy disc um, is hydrated, has lots of water. And so when the disc starts to age or degenerate, um, you get loss of water content. And so um, looking at this picture here of an MRI, again, a sagittal view, um, and using this disc as um, our um, uh, a normal disc, you can see here with the de degeneration, it's kind of black. And so that typically is what happens because you start to lose uh, the water content. Uh, this is often age related, but we can also see these changes in younger population. Uh, when that occurs, it's typically um, related to genetics. 
meaning that they have some sort of family history um, that predisposes them to undergo disc degeneration. Uh, and then over time, the disc starts to get flatter and flatter, almost like a pancake. Uh, so when uh, patients in uh, the elderly uh, population say they used to be 5'6", now they're 5'4", uh, some of that is due to the um, degeneration of the discs uh, in the spine. One thing that oftentimes patients will ask me is, what can I do to get this better? Can I take a medication? Can I do you know, uh, physical therapy? And for degenerative disc disease, it is not reversible. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to have pain from it, um, but it is not reversible. Once it occurs, um, you can't sort of rehydrate that disc. And oftentimes it's progressive, so it continues to get worse. So uh, disc herniations is basically when the disc moves out of place. And as I mentioned, um, the outer portion of the disc, um, there are nerve endings, the annulus. And so what happens is a disc um, material was almost like a jelly substance, sort of herniates or pushes onto the outer part of the disc. And again, there are nerve endings. And so that's when uh, you start to develop pain because there's stress or tension on um, a particular one side of the disc, it's asymmetric. And then that can start to cause uh, pain. Uh, common causes of disc herniations, you can have a single injury, so there are some work-related injuries or lifting something heavy, um, you can herniate a disc, you know, exercising, um, but oftentimes it can occur with mundane things. Um, it can be repetitive movements, um, excessive strain, and even something is bending or sitting. I've had many stories of patients saying, you know, they were just sitting in the car, you know, driving down to Florida. They got out of the car and they had significant pain or they were bending down to you know, tie their shoe and they had pain. So you don't always have to have this you know, great you know, story about how the pain started. Oftentimes it can occur with uh, very mundane things. One important thing to note about uh, herniations, disc herniations is that they can heal, they can get better. Um, the body can reabsorb the disc material. Um, and also with certain uh, types of intervention, like physical therapy, you can kind of get the disc sort of uh, pop back in place, so to speak. Um, and then moving on to our uh, MRI um, picture uh, here at the bottom, this is an example of a disc herniation. So you can see here how um, the disc is sort of extending into the spinal canal here. That's typically what we see. Here you can see almost like a little bit of an outpouching. That's more of a bulge. And um, I'll talk about um, later on the difference between a disc bulge and a disc herniation. Okay. My apologies again with some of the technical difficulties here. So. Uh, the set mediated back pain. So again, that involves a joint um, in the back. And um, what typically happens with these joints, just like with any other joint, um, you can develop pain uh, as a result of inflammation um, or degenerative changes, arthritis um, in these uh, small joints. Um, this particular uh, condition is more common with aging, uh, but we also do see it in the younger population. Again, it can be related to genetics. Also, um, uh, some people who have a lifestyle or occupation that is particularly strenuous on the body, uh, sometimes that can uh, put increased stress and strain on these joints. Uh, typically, when someone presents with um, pain due to uh, the small joints in the back of the facets, they will report um, more pain with staying and walking, uh, transitional movements. That means getting up from a bending to, I'm sorry, sitting to a standing position. And they'll typically have less pain uh, or no pain with sitting. So uh, finally, the sacroiliac uh, joint, uh, again, that's that large joint I told you about that is formed by the tailbone and part of the pelvic bone. Um, that also, just like any other joint, you can develop degenerative changes, um, arthritis. Um, also, as I mentioned uh, before, there you don't get a lot of movement from that joint. Um, in normal circumstances, there's lots of ligaments in that area. And so anytime there's a situation where there's increased motion or stress or strain to the joint, you can start to develop pain. So examples of that can be if you have a leg length discrepancy, um, and that can um, be caused by uh, limping because you have you know, pain in your knee or pain in your ankle, or if you had some sort of replacement surgery in your knee or your hip that's kind of left um, your uh, legs sort of uneven, 
that can put more stress and strain into that joint. Uh, sometimes when I have patients who come in who have, you know, uh, ankle injuries and they're in a boot, I always make sure to remind them to have some sort of um, even up or something on their a lift on their other shoe, because if they're not even, they can start to have pain. And the analogy is kind of like walking in a high heel in a flat shoe. If you did that all day, eventually your back's going to start to hurt. And then also there's trauma uh, with joint pain. So if you fell down or, or, or sometimes motor vehicle accidents can um, cause sort of like a shift uh, in that joint and cause pain. And then also after spinal fusions, again, you're not supposed to get a lot of motion to this joint. And so um, after uh, spine surgery, if there's a fusion, the purpose of the fusion is to eliminate motion through those segments. So in order for your body to you know, do the things, bend, twist, um, that your body's going to have to compensate by getting motion from another area. And oftentimes um, that increased motion or stress uh, uh, it, um, comes through the sacroiliac joint. So uh, important thing to note about sacroiliac joint pain is that it often mimics uh, pain related to a herniated disc or sciatica pinched nerve. And so that's why uh, when before we sort of give someone this diagnosis, it's important to uh, rule out any other causes. So we oftentimes call this um, a diagnosis a diagnosis of exclusion, since it can mimic other conditions that are structurally abnormal to the spine, we want to make sure that you in fact don't have that. So we get an MRI, make sure you don't have a disc herniation that's contributing to your symptoms, make sure that you don't have um, compression of the nerve root in your spine, uh, you know, that may be contributing to leg pain. Um, usually with this condition, uh, the pain is worse with standing and walking, but I've also seen patients that have pain with transitional movements um, uh, uh, and also with sitting sometimes. Uh, one thing that this um, diagram is not showing is that um, when you have SI joint pain, in addition to having pain in the back, you can also have pain in the buttock. So spondylolisthesis, uh, this um, refers to uh, alignment issues. And so um, specifically it results when one vertebrae here slips in front of the vertebrae next to it here. So you can see this vertebrae is kind of slipped forward. Um, it, the most common causes, uh, one is degenerative. So as I mentioned before, as it disc degenerates, it loses that water content. So it kind of um, uh, uh, flattens out like a pancake. And then that causes uh, increased um, stress through the joints. Oftentimes that's coupled with arthritis in the joints. Um, and then the surrounding ligaments around the joints are weak. And so they're not uh, no longer able to kind of hold that area of the spine in place. So the bone starts to slip forward. There is um, another cause which is called ismic. Uh, and that's basically when you get a stress fracture in the bone. Uh, the specific name of the bone is the pars inticularis, um, uh, but the bone slips forward um, because of the weakening or thinning of the bone. Uh, it can also be congenital where you can have thinning of the bone uh, and over because it's not particularly painful initially, you may not even know you have it. And then over time, the bone starts to thin and then you can develop a stress fracture. And then once that bone slips further and further and further out, you start to get compression of the surrounding nerve roots and then uh, causing leg pain. And then that's normally when um, we're made aware of it. Uh, one of the important things uh, with, with this condition of spondylolisthesis is that um, you want to determine whether or not um, the condition is stable or unstable. And so uh, basically it means that if uh, the bones are shifting with movement, um, because if they're shifting with movement, then that particularly increases risk of nerve compression. Uh, to determine whether or not um, the uh, area is stable or unstable, we'll get flexion extension x-rays. And if the bone is unstable, meaning it's shifting with movement uh, and, and leads to uh, compression of nerves, this could be an indication for uh, spine surgery in which they re relieve the pressure off the nerve and realign the bones. So then moving on to compression fractures, uh, these can be caused by trauma. Uh, but also um, uh, if you have osteoporosis or uh, bone loss, bone thinning, or your bones are brittle, um, all caused by osteoporosis, uh, this can make you more prone to fractures with, um, you know, simple activity, you know, um, like sitting or bending forward. Um, uh, treatment is typically supportive. Um, 
when we mean supportive, we mean us. pain medication, bracing is sometimes indicated if patients are having uh, quite a bit of pain. And then physical therapy, oftentimes um, when you're in pain, you don't move as much, those muscles start to get weak. And so you're not walking as much. And so physical therapy can be uh, useful in sort of getting you back to your baseline. Usually compression fractures heal over six to eight weeks. Doesn't mean you're gonna be in pain that entire time, uh, but um, it does um, usually, uh, that's the amount of time that we give for the bone to heal. Um, if the bone, um, if you continue to have pain and that bone does not heal, uh, then we start moving on to um, uh, in interventional procedures, which is called a kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. And again, this is done if the fracture doesn't heal and there's persistent pain. So basically what is done is um, a uh, needle is inserted, it has a bevel or opening, and um, specifically with kyphoplasty, uh, a balloon um, is um, filled with air to kind of um, uh, uh, kind of reapproximate the bone and kind of uh, get it back to its normal size. Because as I mentioned before, you can see in this other picture, uh, the bone is compressed. Sorry about that. Uh, you can see here uh, that the bone is kind of per, per, uh, compressed or wedge shaped. So what they do is um, they try to, um, um, they inflate a balloon that tries to kind of restore that height of the bone. And then a bone cement is uh, injected into that, um, into that fracture to kind of stabilize those bones uh, so they don't move anymore. Uh, bones uh, in themselves um, uh, are highly vascular and they have nerve endings. And so you can imagine if you have a fracture, just like you would in any other body part, um, it can be painful. So stabilizing that and minimizing movement of those fragments uh, can reduce your pain. This is performed as an outpatient procedure and under fluoroscopy, which is x-ray uh, guidance. And then finally, uh, bone tumors. I just want to spend a little bit of time on this, not too much. I, I just want to highlight, you know, not all tumors or lesions are cancerous. Um, if there is something that is seen on MRI that looks suspicious, um, usually additional testing is needed. So if you are told by, you know, your physician uh, or provider, you know, that they see a suspicious lesion, uh, please don't always assume it's cancer. Additional testing typically needs to be done to confirm it. Um, but um, people who have a history of breast uh, prostate or lung cancer, um, oftentimes um, can get metastasis of that cancer to the bone. Uh, so if I have patients who have this past medical history, um, I almost always um, will, um, you know, um, get an MRI, do follow-up studies just to make sure everything's okay. So again, I wanted to highlight uh, back pain in women uh, because uh, from um, uh, it typically occurs more in uh, women than men as far as back pain. And again, as I stated before, reasons are um, women undergo hormonal changes uh, with you know, lower estrogen, which can result in decreased bone mineral density, uh, weight gain, and difficulty losing weight, particularly in abdominal section. Uh, because we're losing these hormones, also men as well with regards to muscle weakness with the testosterone, it makes it difficult to build and maintain muscle mass. Um, and then also uh, women who um, have difficult pregnancies, um, who have multiple pregnancies, uh, that can put a lot of stress and strain um, on the muscles uh, around the spine, particularly the core muscles and the pelvic floor muscles, and that can lead to pain. Another thing that women experience during pregnancy is a release of elastin, which is a hormone that specifically, um, uh, the specific purpose is to loosen ligaments uh, to prepare for uh, uh, delivery of your child for childbirth. So even if you go through uh, a C-section, your body is still preparing uh, to deliver this, uh, uh, this child vaginally. And so um, with loosening of these ligaments, um, as I, I showed in uh, previous pictures, you know, that sacroiliac joint has lots of ligaments around it to support it. So you can imagine if your body's releasing this elastin to loosen these ligaments, you can get increased um, instability of the sacroiliac joint. So oftentimes women who are pregnant will use SI joint belts or, or have back pain um, you know, during their pregnancy and sometimes afterwards. I uh, just want to highlight non-medical causes for back pain and not overlook this. Uh, there are uh, other non-medical causes uh, that may need to be explored, uh, particularly if, um, you know, workup for back pain is negative uh, with MRI. Um, 
So meaning we state that. So if MRI is negative uh, for back pain and you have a past medical history of some of these other things, it's important to consider uh, these other medical causes. So abdominal or aneurysms can cause referred back pain, um, GI issues, uh, cholecystitis, pancreatitis. It's a little higher up in the spine, uh, but it can cause pain in the back. You can get shingles. I've diagnosed this a couple of times. A lot of times people don't look, you know, um, in the back there uh, in mirrors. And so oftentimes, you know, um, the rash comes and then it goes and then they'll have back pain. So shingles can be a, um, a, a potential cause. And then gynecological uh, for women, there's some listed there. And then finally, kidney stones. Um, that can often be a cause of back pain as well. So it's just important to kind of, when you look at a patient, even though we're spine specialists, you know, we kind of want to look at everything in totality. Um, when we are assessing for back pain. I want to emphasize that this list is not uh, comprehensive, just kind of the highlighting some of uh, some causes. So treatment, I'm just going to show you, this slide is just to show you what I'm going to sort of delve in in future slides, uh, but treatment, we're going to get into medications, uh, physical therapy, there's a specific therapy that I like to use for, phys, uh, for, for back issues, injections, uh, surgery, which is very limited, uh, for uh, the purposes of treating back pain, and then alternative and holistic. Um, I am definitely a proponent of using other uh, treatment options, particularly if a patient is not comfortable doing medications or injections, you know, um, uh, they can also be of benefit. So treatment, uh, anti-inflammatory medications. I apologize, my next few slides are going to be a little bit more um, uh, busy. I was trying to get as much information as possible, uh, so um, I will, um, hopefully it's still a benefit, although the slides are a little bit busy. So with oral steroids, with, um, with anti-inflammatories, there's two different categories. The first I'm going to discuss is oral steroids. Typically when someone receives an oral steroid, it's a medjol dose pack, and um, it's given uh, for short, it's a short-term use, so it's given over six days. And um, the purpose is to quickly reduce inflammation, whether it's originating from the muscle, like a lumbar, uh, lumbar um, strain, or if it's from um, arthritis in the joint or involving the disc. We will also give it for nerve pain, but again, I'm not uh, speaking too much about nerve uh, pain because that typically affects the legs and not the back. Common side effects of uh, oral steroids, again, this is not a comprehensive list, but it can uh, increase blood pressure temporarily, uh, cause fluid retention. Uh, sometimes people experience palpitations or almost like they're feeling a little anxious. And then also it can increase your blood sugars. Typically with um, uh, hyperglycemia or increase in blood sugars, that's usually not a problem for um, uh, people unless uh, you have a history of diabetes. And then there's anti-inflammatory medicate or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. These are your ibuprofen, your naproxen, your meloxicam, uh, your Celebrex. Um, these can be used for short-term or long-term use um, to reduce inflammation and swelling. Again, whether it's of the disc, uh, the joint, uh, muscles, or again, nerve. Um, side effects, again, not a comprehensive list, but these are the most common side effects increased blood pressure. So if you go to your primary care doctor, your cardiologist and follow up, and they're telling you that your blood pressure is a little high, uh, before they start putting up, you know, adding medications or adjusting your medications, you know, let them know that you're on, you know, an anti-inflammatory and see if maybe uh, cutting back or stopping that medication will improve your pressure. Anti-inflammatories can cause an uh, upset of the stomach. Um, so that can be something as simple as just like a stomach irritation uh, where you feel nauseous. Um, it can be even as extreme as ulcers. Um, uh, and overall, it can increase your bleeding risk, particularly with um, medications uh, that are blood thinners. Uh, so if you are taking those medications, um, typically it's contraindicated. Uh, so if you're on um, you know, Eliquis or Warfarin, um, it's important to avoid these medications. If you're taking uh, you know, baby aspirin or regular aspirin, it's typically okay, but we just want to sort of monitor you. Muscle relaxers. Um, there's two main types of muscle relaxers. Um, there are benzodiazepines like Valium, which is often prescribed in the ER. And then there are non-benzodiazepines. An example would be cyclobenzaprine, also known as Flexro. Uh, these are used to treat muscle spasms and pain. Oftentimes it's combined with a non-steroidal like ibuprofen and naproxen. 
These can be used for short-term or long-term use. Um, often patients will have uh, difficulty tolerating these medications. They can cause drowsiness, sedation, uh, dizziness, specifically with benzodiazepines like Valium or clonazepam uh, or Ativan. Um, it can cause uh, respiratory uh, depression. And then with uh, chronic use of uh, benzodiazepines, and then you stop them abruptly without the, um, the direction or guidance of your uh, a treating physician, uh, it can cause seizures. So I uh, typically do not prescribe uh, benzodiazepines. So then we're just briefly talking about scheduled medications. I typically do not, um, oh, I use scheduled medications in uh, limited circumstances. I do think that, you know, uh, they can be very helpful and beneficial for people and keeping them active and functional. Uh, but um, I typically try to avoid these medications um, if possible. But I do understand that people, uh, you know, there are uh, situations where patients uh, need these medications and can truly benefit from them. So the opioids or narcotics, just want to focus on Schedule 4 and Schedule 2 medications. So Schedule 4 medications are like tramadol, Tylenol number 3 with codeine, and then the Schedule 2 medications are like Percocet, Vicodin. So um, New Jersey uh, legislation only allows us now to uh, provide an initial prescription for five days. I know that can be frustrating for, pa for patients, uh, but this is uh, the new law. However, uh, once um, you have a conversation with your uh, physician, your prescribing physician or provider, and you determine you know, that the medication is effective, not experience any side effects, and the medication is being um, taken as prescribed, then additional prescriptions, uh, longer ones of 30 days can be given. Um, oftentimes too, insurance companies will limit uh, the quantity of, of which you can prescribe at one time. I've had situations where an insurance will only approve you know, one or two weeks at a time. Again, very frustrating, um, but um, there is a lot of regulation now with these types of medications. Uh, common side effects include, again, not a comprehensive list, uh, constipation, drowsiness or sedation, nausea, itchiness, uh, and then also abuse or addiction. Um, so um, transitioning on to uh, uh, physical therapy, as I mentioned before, um, uh, there's a specific type of physical therapy that I like to use, uh, which is the McKenzie-based therapy. And it was designed by Robin McKenzie, a physical therapist. Uh, specifically, uh, they use uh, mechanical diagnosis and treatment. Uh, there is an emphasis on directional preference. So what position hurts the most? So is it standing? Is it sitting? Um, and, and that's important. There are some situations where, you know, people don't have a specific directional preference, um, but more, uh, more often than not, uh, there is a position that is more preferred than the other um, as far as um, uh, uh, causing exacerbation or alleviation of pain. Again, as I mentioned before, usually disc-mediated disc pain is often worse with bending, sitting, lifting, uh, and um, uh, uh, facet mediated pain or joint pain is um, usually worse with standing walking. So if you can use that as a framework, um, help to guide uh, the physical therapy. So you do exercises initially in that patient's uh, directional preference with the goal of focusing on core stabilization and strengthening. Um, specifically for disc herniations, uh, the goal is to do these exercises in a specific position to try to get that disc back in place. So usually uh, that will involve uh, uh, prone press ups, which is here in D, um, if you have a disc um, uh, mediated type of pain. Uh, it's important to know with, with this type of uh, McKenzie method, um, always trying to figure out what is causing the back pain. Um, and so uh, using that information with, along with directional preference can be beneficial um, in uh, getting your back pain to improve. Uh, most importantly is an active program. So I'm very specific about my uh, physical therapy notes and that, or physical therapy uh, prescriptions and that I always say limit modalities. While heat and, um, you know, and cold uh, ice can be beneficial, 
I have never seen a situation where someone said they didn't get better because they didn't get enough heat, they didn't get enough ice. Plus, these are things that you can do at home. So physical therapy is meant to be an active program, not a passive program. So you should be doing more of the exercises as opposed to exercises be, being done to you or stretching being done to you. Um, and then again, modalities like, you know, ice and heat, I try to limit those. Again, you know, you're spending your time at therapy and you want to be an active program, not things that you can do at home on your own. Uh, and then core uh, stabilization and stretching. Again, uh, it's very important to get the core muscles strong. They can act as a brace um, as well as shock absorbers, um, you know, to alleviate your pain. Uh, and then also with um, the McKenzie method, um, as uh, keeping up with the goal is to reduce the pain, but also to make you independent so you can manage your pain alone. I think what gives me the most joy in doing my job is not, you know, doing an injection that patient says I feel better. It's when someone said, you know what, I did the work, I went to physical therapy, did X amount of sessions, and now I can, I can uh, control uh, my back pain. I can, you know, keep it, um, uh, um, uh, at bay. I know the things that I can do to, to um, minimize exacerbations, or I knew when I was at work, there were certain things that I was doing that was flying my back pain. Now I can do it differently. Um, and all of this is the goal is to return to normal daily activities. So if someone were to tell me that they have back pain, uh, but um, they, um, they had, they don't have any back pain, but they, they don't do anything all day or they didn't resume either. Not go, they didn't go back to, you know, exercise or golfing to me, that's not success. I'd rather someone say that they have um, a little bit of pain manageable, but they're able to go back and do the things that they enjoy doing, whether it's CrossFit, you know, uh, golfing, you know, uh, daily walks, as opposed to saying they have no pain, but they do nothing. So again, I talked a little bit about core strength stabilization. So what is core strength? Oftentimes core strength isn't actually, uh, doesn't always look like this. Uh, even though we'd like to think that, you know, we see patients or, or people, I should say, you know, who have these, um, you know, uh, washboard abs and they go, oh, wow, they're core st uh, strong. Not necessarily. Um, I always give the analogy when I'm talking about core is that you're only as strong as your foundation. So um, when you look at the abs, uh, that is actually not the foundation of your core. Uh, the, the foundation of your core is actually your pelvic floor musculature. And that goes back to with women, why we um, kind of have so many problems with back pain, uh, because our, core, our, our pelvic floor muscles, which form the foundation of a core, are often um, uh, stressed and strained, you know, with, um, with uh, uh, um, pregnancy. So, uh, and move. so it's important, again, to have that strong foundation, because again, as I showed with that other picture, you can have, you know, a great roof, great siding, but if the foundation, whatever the pelvic floor in this case is weak, everything's going to fall down. Um, and so it's oftentimes important to consider building from the bottom up. Um, so with regards to the, um, the, the core musculature, you think of it like a cylinder. So there's a top, a, a front, a back, a top, and a bottom. They're all kind of intertwined. So the bottom is the pelvic floor. Um, the front is actually the transverse abdominus muscles. Um, and these are the muscles that you engage when you're trying to hold in, say, if you have to go to the bathroom and you, you can't go right away. So that muscle that you engage to hold your urine is actually the transverse abdominus muscle. The back muscles that we focus on are motifidae, and then um, the top of the core is actually the diaphragm, and a diaphragm is a muscle. And so um, moving on to injections, uh, trigger point injections I'll talk about. Uh, this is just a basic slide to kind of give you an overview of what I'm going to delve into with injections. So I'm going to talk a little bit about trigger point injections and then spinal injections, which are done under x-ray. Notice I'm not saying epidural or cortisone shots. Um, when you say cortisone shot, that doesn't mean anything. Cortisone just represents or um, defines a medication. Um, but it doesn't uh, tell you about the type of injection that you're getting. So again, spinal injections, which fall under that umbrella are epidural uh, facet injections, and then you can get uh, radiofrequency ablation procedures. So trigger point injections are done to target muscle pain, as I mentioned before, like a lumbar uh, strain. Uh, lidocaine is typically used uh, so that you can tolerate the procedure. So the lidocaine is injected, uh, and the reason why it burns is because lidocaine is acidic, so that's why it burns. But once um, the lidocaine numbs the area, then we sort of move the needle in different areas of the muscle in different quadrants, and the goal is to kind of get uh, the muscle to relax 
And when we see the relaxation, we'll see a twitch response. Um, oftentimes, because you're creating some trauma uh, to the muscle, there's going to be some bleeding, but that's okay. And um, then when I say bleeding, it's of the cap, the surrounding capillaries. Uh, that's okay because within blood, there are healing factors. And so when blood sort of gets into that area, that can start to also heal the muscle. Uh, in addition to the muscle sort of re relaxing with that twitch response. I apologize again for these technical. Seems like it works sometimes and then it doesn't work. Let's see here. Okay, uh, so with, with the risk of uh, with trigger point injections are minimal. I always say anytime you break the skin barrier, there's always risk for infection, but the area is uh, prior to the injection, the area is cleaned well with alcohol. So that minimizes any um, uh, infection. Sometimes you can get bruising. Um, again, those capillaries um, can be disrupted. And sometimes um, that release of that, that's um, a little bit of blood can sometimes lead to bruising. Uh, there are situations where people experience increased pain uh, and then um, I know there's some situations where doctors use steroid. I typically don't use steroid. The reason for that is because uh, it can cause some discoloration to, to the skin in that area. And also um, it can call, cause atrophy of the muscle and necrosis of the muscle. Uh, so basically that area of the muscle kind of dies. So epidural injections. Um, what happens here is a form of steroid medication, people say cortisone, is ejected around the disc or the nerve using fluoroscopy. The goal of an epidural injection is to reduce inflammation and pain. Again, um, we're not changing any uh, uh, the structure of the spine. And so um, by uh, reducing the inflammation or swelling um, uh, in that area, um, that sort of um, re reduces uh, the pain. Um, uh, with regards to epidural injections, oftentimes they're commonly used to treat leg pain. So the medicine is placed around the nerve. However, um, using an epidural uh, that technique allows us to get medicine around the disc. So if someone has discogenic back pain due to degenerative discs or herniated discs, uh, we can use epidural injections to kind of get steroid medication around those nerves. I'm sorry, around the disc. Um, uh, injections can be repeated every three months. And then um, side effects um, or, or adverse reactions, these are most common. Uh, you can develop increased pain. Now that typically can happen um, within the first, um, immediately after the injection and can last up to two weeks until the effects of the steroid take, um, uh, until you start to notice uh, positive benefits from the steroid. Um, again, even though we're targeting the disc in this particular situation for back pain, the nerve is uh, in close proximity, so it's possible that there can be uh, some nerve injury. Um, less likely because these injections are done under x-ray guidance, uh, and so there are multiple uh, steps and safety checks that are, um, are done uh, before the medication is injected. You can develop a reaction to the steroids, uh, which is facial flushing, again, fluid retention, blood pressure issues, uh, blood sugar issues. And then again, uh, steroid over time can weaken bone as well as joints. Um, again, with any, any injection, when you break the skin barrier, you can develop bleeding and infection. There are situations where the epidural injection is unfortunately ineffective. And then sometimes, depending on the technique of the injection, um, you can develop a spinal headache, which is positional. Uh, joint injections, um, this is where we're targeting the facet joint or the sacroiliac joint. Uh, so again, once again, a form of steroid or cortisone is injected into the joint to reduce inflammation and pain. Uh, this can also be repeated every three months. Uh, and the reason why I say every three months, because that is typically um, uh, the duration of uh, steroid um, as far as its effectiveness in the body. And then radiofrequency ablation. Uh, this is an out outpatient procedure, which is done to target uh, pain from joints. So it can be done for facet joints or uh, sacroiliac joints. And this involves, involves burning a small nerve called a medial branch. Uh, it is important uh, to mention that the nerve that is being targeted is not are not the nerves that go down your legs that, that provide sensation and power to your legs. Specifically, this nerve um, in the case of joint pain is causing, is sending um, an abnormal pain signal to the joint. So by burning that nerve, you block that pain signal uh, uh, between um, your brain and the joint. Um, it can take, uh, um, I'm sorry, did I miss this slide? Okay, so I'll expand a little bit more. Uh, so sometimes it can take anywhere from four to six weeks for you to start to notice benefits. 
Um, and this, in, this procedure can repeat, be repeated every anywhere from six months uh, to two years. The reason why it's that wide um, kind of time frame is because it depends on how long it takes for the nerve to regrow. Uh, usually uh, the nerve takes about six months to regrow, uh, but the older you are, the slower the nerve, uh, the slower that the nerve grows back. And then if your pain comes back with regrowth of the nerve, uh, you can have this procedure repeated. Uh, one last thing, um, the uh, nerve, um, uh, the medial branch does provide a little bit of um, a nerve supply to the multifidi muscles, and I mentioned before, are responsible for uh, some co for core stabilization um, as far as the core musculature. And so if you have a patient that is um, um, uh, really um, sort of an octogenarian or uh, elderly, and they already have weak core muscles, you know, their posture is bad, they're leaning forward, they're, they don't have the strength to stand up. Uh, typically, uh, we would consider not doing this procedure because um, ablating these nerves can further cause weakening of those muscles. But if you are um, uh, otherwise, um, you know, um, uh, young or even, you know, in um, 60s, 70s, um, it should be okay. But that may be a conversation to have with your doctor, particularly if you have um, uh, postural issues. And then finally, surgery. This is a very small slide because the indications for surgery related to back pain are very minimal. Um, as I mentioned before, with spondylolisthesis, you have instability of the spine when one of the bones slips forward. The concern is that um, it can uh, press on nerves that go down your legs. And so that's why surgery is done for this condition to kind of realign the bones, um, stabilize them to take the pressure off of the nerves. Um, when people say they had a herniated disc that was removed, uh, typically the disc uh, isn't uh, removed because of the back pain. It is done to relieve the pressure off the nerve causing leg pain. So if someone says, hey, I have a herniated disc and they just have back pain, or they say, hey, I have arthritis in my back, you know, can you just, you know, go and scope it out like you do a knee? Uh, that's not typically how, um, uh, how, how things are done for the spine. Uh, you have to have typically um, involvement of spinal nerves, uh, typically uh, to have surgery on the back. And then alternative treatment, I did see uh, someone asking a little bit more uh, detail with alternative treatment. So I, I think that there are so many ways that you can address back pain. I don't think that there is one cookie cutter way for anyone. I think uh, for chiropractors, they can do an exceptional job, you know, um, uh, managing uh, back pain. Uh, oftentimes, I will uh, consider chiropractic care if someone has axial back pain, meaning that uh, they have pain uh, by caused by a disc or joint um, that's unrelated uh, to leg pain. So they're not experiencing any sciatica or pinching of the nerves. Uh, typically, I will uh, refer to chiropractic care. I know some people have had great relief um, with chiropractic care for sciatica. I'm a little... Um, uh, hesitant to uh, refer when there is nerve involvement because some manipulation that can be done can cause increased pressure uh, and cause more leg pain. Uh, acupuncture can be done uh, for back pain. Uh, I'm not an acupuncturist, and I know that there's a lot of intensive training that is done uh, to master uh, um, uh, this skill. Uh, so I won't go into detail about acupuncture itself, but what I will say is that acupuncture can be another alternative uh, treatment uh, for managing back pain. Uh, for patients who aren't comfortable doing medications or injections, or on oftentimes when they've done everything and nothing has worked, kind of looking outside the box and considering acupuncture can be helpful. And then finally, anti-inflammatory diet. Um, you know, the idea that you have a lot of inflammation in your body that can contribute to inflammation in other structures. Uh, sometimes I will recommend an, an anti-inflammatory diet. It's not about eliminating food groups, it's about eliminating certain things that promote inflammation and increasing things in your diet that help with inflammation inflammation. So example would be reducing red meat, you know, gluten type products. Um, uh, but again, not completely avoiding food groups. So um, that is the main crux of my lecture. Um, I just wanted to kind of briefly uh, talk in the next few minutes about um, common myths and questions that I often will experience or hear from patients in the office. So one of them is, you know, when I'm asking about prior history of uh, back pain or back issues, oh yeah, doc, I got bulging discs from L1 to L5. It's terrible. I got bulging discs. So typically what I would say is, okay, um, most people when they age, um, they have bulging discs. So when someone says they have bulging discs, I don't necessarily think that that is something pathologic. Um, so then the next question is, what is the difference between a bulging disc and a herniated disc? 
as I mentioned before, um, you with a bulging disc that's normal wear and tear. So you have a disc that um, some of the disc material uh, maybe uh, migrates to one portion of the disc. The reason why this isn't pathologic is because that annulus or that outer layer of the disc, which has the nerve endings, remains intact. Okay, so it's very important. Uh, the outer part of the disc remains intact. Um, this is different from a herniated disc where you can uh, experience a tear in that outer layer or annulus of the disc, and then the disc material starts to herniate through that open area. That is when um, it can potentially become a source of pain. So um, the other question I briefly kind of um, mentioned is, can you see herniated disc on x-ray? All the time I'll have patients say, hey doc, you know, I got herniated disc and I ask them, well, how, how, how was that diagnosis? Oh yeah, I had x-rays, doctor told me or so-and-so told me that I had herniated disc. As you can see with x-ray, you cannot see disc herniations. You can see the disc spaces. And sometimes if that disc uh, space is narrowed, you can um, uh, assume or, or diagnose someone with degenerative disc disease. Cause I mentioned when you lose that water content in the disc, it starts to kind of flatten out like a pancake. So you can have, you can diagnose disc degeneration, but you cannot diagnose a disc herniation on x-ray. And then another one people really get upset about is why do I have to do six weeks of physical therapy before I can get an MRI? So it's very frustrating to patients and they come in, they've been having back pain, you know, for, you know, two, three years, but they never did anything about it. You know, they kind of muscled through it. And now they're coming to a doctor and they want things done. And then we tell them, sorry, we can't order the MRI, you need therapy. Um, so this is um, part of standard of care that has kind of um, been developed by uh, insurance companies, the big bad wolf in some cases. Um, so the idea is that most, as I told you before, um, disc herniations uh, can be reversible. They can get better. And so oftentimes you want to give that period of time for the disc, um, uh, for the disc herniation to resolve. And so, uh, again, I know some people come and they've been having pain for months, um, but certain times when you, in, you start initiating physical therapy, or form of treatment, uh, like the McKenzie method, um, that can help to sort of heal that disc, kind of push that disc in place. Um, also strengthen the core, can kind of support the spine better. And so even though six, uh, six weeks of physical therapy seems like a long time, that duration of time is needed to try to start to notice the positive benefits of physical therapy. It takes time to strengthen muscles. And so that's why that six weeks of uh, time is given. Uh, with the McKenzie method, an MRI is not needed uh, to do the therapy appropriately. Because again, we look at focusing on uh, mechanical diagnosis and treatment, uh, directional preference, all of those things come into play when we're coming up with a treatment plan. And again, you know, physical therapy doesn't work for everybody. So it's important, you know, if physical therapy doesn't work, or if you uh, experience increased pain during physical therapy, uh, at that time, there is a sort of justification or indication for getting MRI. So if you get through 60 weeks of physical therapy, you know better, or during physical therapy, your pain increases. Those are two indications for an MRI. Using that information, we can do things more invasive, like an injection, or um, if, again, that disc starts to press on a nerve, uh, we can consider surgical consultation. Uh, another one is, can I get surgery if I have back pain from a bulging disc or arthritis? I did mention this a little bit more. So uh, the answer um, uh, in most cases, I never say uh, never for anything, but the majority of the time, the answer is no. Again, uh, surgery is done to decompress nerves or to release pressure off nerves. So if you have uh, back pain or arthritic back pain without any um, uh, nerve compression, uh, then surgery is typically not recommended. Doc, my sciatica is causing my back pain. So again, uh, nerve compression does not cause back pain. Um, when you have compression of those large nerves, it will cause pain, numbness, tingling, or weakness in the legs. So uh, typically when I have patients say they have sciatica, I ask them to describe what they mean. And if they're sort of pointing to pain across their back, then it is not sciatica. And then uh, final 
uh, slide I believe I have here is uh, do inflam anti inflammatories mask the pain? Some patients will not want to take anti inflammatories, they feel like it masks the pain. So, again, when you develop, um, you know, disc herniation uh, or arthritis, there is a component of inflammation, and inflammation leads to pain. And so, the medications that are prescribed, like an anti inflammatory uh, oral steroid or uh, naproxen, the purpose is to reduce the inflammation, which is contributing to your pain. So, we're trying to sort of to get you back to your baseline where you didn't have any pain. Um, so um, my response to that is that it's not masking the pain. Prescribing anti-inflammatories is no different than what I would prescribe uh, if I was a uh, cardiologist giving you medicine for blood pressure. No one says, hey, I'm not taking that medication, doc, because I don't want to mask my blood pressure. No, you're taking the um, uh, uh, blood pressure medication to control and manage the hypertension. Um, so I look at it in a similar similar way. I did see someone mention about spinal stenosis. Uh, yes, so spinal stenosis is compression of the nerves in the nerve canal, in the center nerve canal. And again, that causes leg pain, not back pain. And just kind of wrapping up, thank you so much for taking time out of this beautiful day uh, to uh, listen to my lecture. Um, if you're interested in scheduling an appointment at Rothman with myself as a physiatrist or any one, one of my colleagues, uh, you can call this number and make an appointment. Uh, so for the remaining time, um, we can open it up to questions. I did see a lot of questions pop up. Thank you for your, um, your interest in being engaged in the conversation. I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Maybe I'll uh, pass it along to Melanie to sort of give me- um, Dr. Woods, thank you. This is such valuable information. I hope everyone's gonna have some great takeaways from this. And we had a lot of great questions to come in. And one of the first questions we had, is there a way to rehydrate the disc? Unfortunately, no. Uh, so once that disc starts to undergo degeneration, there's nothing that you can do to rehydrate that disc. Um, and it can actually progress and get worse. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have pain from it, um, but um, you cannot rehydrate the disc. Okay, is uh, lower back pain associated with leg cramps? Uh, so low back pain in and of itself is not associated with leg cramps. If you have a compression of nerves uh, in your back, um, that can contribute to cramping in the legs. Uh, but there are a lot of other causes. I know I mentioned sort of non-medical causes for uh, back pain. Some non-medical causes, I'm sorry, some medical causes for leg cramping could be electrolyte um, imbalances. It could be um, your cholesterol medication. Um, you know, that uh, may be contributing to cramps. Um, it can be, you know, um, a neurologic issue. Um, so it's important to kind of look at everything in totality. Uh, but certainly if you have, you know, um, a pinched nerve or spinal stenosis, that can contribute to leg cramps because you're getting compression of the nerves, which in turn is sending incomplete signals to those muscles that they control. So it's almost, I think of it almost like short circuiting. And so you're getting that cramping because you're getting an incomplete signal. And um, Spondio, Lisa, the thesis come from trauma? So uh, yes, uh, I did not mention that as uh, one of the causes because it's not a common cause. It can happen, but it is it is rare. But yes, you can get um, a spondylolisthesis uh, from trauma. The question is an Ironman inversion table I use to stretch my back out. What's your opinion of the inversion table? So uh, inversion tables, I have a lot of patients that use them. If you have one available to you and you use it, uh, that can be helpful to kind of distract the spine. You know, if you have joint, um, you know, joint pain or disc pain, um, I typically uh, will not recommend that someone go purchase one um, because the literature out there, um, when you try to look as much evidence-based, um, there is not um, resounding, you know, evidence that it, um, it works. Uh, and so if you have a situation where you have access to one or you're using one and find it's helpful, then I will, you know, encourage you to continue to use it. Um, please explain a vertiflex and when it might be indicated. A, a vertebroplasty? It just says vertiflex. Maybe that question was wrong. Is it vertebroplasty? I'm not sure. Well, if someone can elaborate, we'll um, come back to that if you can. Um, what are the best exercises for, for sacroiliac pain? Oh, very good. So, um, so it also involves a core stabilization. It's, it's not too far off that, uh, from what you would do for, um, 
uh, pain higher up in the spine involving the facets. Uh, you want to get the muscles around um, the pelvis uh, nice and strong. There are situations where we'll recommend for, uh, pelvic core therapy, again, strengthening the core from the bottom up. Oftentimes, um, you're getting increased motion from that joint. And so um, you want to do some muscle energy techniques. Um, therapists often will do this to try to um, uh, um, create a muscle balance and muscle synergy to kind of stabilize the pelvis and that joint and that joint. Also too, um, uh, trying to eliminate the inciting factor. So again, you know, if you have, you know, pain in your knee or your hip, trying to um, correct that, which will improve your gait and your movements uh, and your, um, uh, uh, the kinetics of, of how you move, that can improve your, your back pain as well from SI joint. One of the questions, which it might be a longer question, is how do you treat scoliosis? So um, I get that a lot. I was debating whether or not to talk about that, and I decided not to. Um, okay. So scoliosis um, oftentimes is not, and I'll be in detail, but oftentimes is not a cause for back pain. Um, and But there are some caveats to that. So um, when you develop scoliosis, usually the, you get the curvature in your spine when your growth plates are open. So when you're younger, once your growth plates fuse, you typically don't get any additional curvature unless it is degenerative. So again, as we age, um, we women, but also men, um, uh, start to develop um, osteopenia, osteoporosis, the bones get brittle. And so that's when you can kind of get what's called a degenerative scoliosis. So if you have a significant curvature, that can put increased stress and strain on those on, on joints or your facet joints. And then that can become a cause of pain or the curvature can start to compress nerves that go down your legs, and that can be a cause of pain. So the actual curvature itself is not so much an issue as to the um, compression of structures, the joints, you know, and, and, and potentially surrounding nerves. Another question is about, do you have any examples of anti-inflammatory diets? Uh, yes. So... Um, Oftentimes, um, so I always tell patients again, don't eliminate, eliminate uh, food groups unless you have, you know, some medical issues. You want to reduce things. So, reducing red meat, uh, reducing um, gluten products. Um, those are things that promote inflammation. Um, you know, adding, um, you know, fish oil or, or uh, fish. Um, if you're not, uh, if you can't eat fish, you know, flaxseed oil, but omega threes, um, uh, fatty acids are very helpful with inflammation. Uh, Turmeric is helpful with inflammation. Um, so sometimes I'll have patients sort of make adjustments that way, just to kind of start. It's very, you know, that's kind of a basic start. And I believe there's a lot of literature out there. So yeah. Yeah. and also reducing sugar. Sugar oh, is not good. That's a good, that's a good thing. <laughs> Well, uh, Dr. Woods, I just want to thank you again, and I hope everyone uh, learned something and has many takeaways. If you feel like your question wasn't answered, feel free to email me. Um, it's melanie.inace at rothmanortho.com. I will be able to just discuss with Dr. Woods, and we will get back to you with an answer. Also, the recording will be sent to you within about five days, so if some of you had to get off early, um, you'll be able to view the whole um, webinar in its entirety. So thank you for taking time out of your evening and joining us this evening, uh, Dr. Woods. It's such valuable information. So we thank you for taking your time. And thank you so much again for uh, taking time in this beautiful weather to listen uh, to my talk. Thanks very much. And again, uh, please uh, forward to Melanie any questions you have. And if you'd like to see myself, I have excellent colleagues as well. You can call that number and make an appointment. Correct. Everyone have a wonderful evening and thank you. Thank you.